Hey everybody, welcome along to episode 118 of Percussion Discussion. Before we get into it, please check out our social media. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram and also our world famous YouTube channel where you can find all of our conversations past and present. Please subscribe. It only takes a second, doesn't cost you anything. It'll keep you informed um, as to when we have some new content coming your way. Uh, if you'd rather listen on the go, then of course, all of our conversations are available in podcast form. These are free to download from your favorite podcast provider. So if that's your thing, you know what to do. Please rate and review if you can. Helps like-minded drummers find us and like us as much as you do. So I would really appreciate that. On to today's guest. Um, this is a really an amazing episode. Um, a, a guy who kind of flies under the radar a little bit of other drummers um, but that doesn't take away from this guy's ridiculous talent. His discography reads um, of somebody who's about 80 years old and has played consistently and recorded every week. Uh, the discography is insane. Um, he has an amazing touch on the drums. Uh, he's played for such incredible artists as Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, um, Amy Winehouse, Mark Ronson, um, Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars. Um, he's it's just absolute incredible. Um, and what's even cooler, we were talking in um, when we did the interview and he said, I really like your podcast. He says, but the music's not very drummy. And I listened and I thought, yeah, I'm with you on that. So he's very kindly offered to, um, to record something for me. So um, as from now on, our new theme tune, is going to have been played by the fabulous Mr. Homer Steinweiss. Oh, thanks for having me. It's actually an honor to be here. Well, it's the honor is all mine. Trust me. And uh, I know it's it's still still pretty early in New York. Are you an early riser generally, or are you if you made it like a special uh, I, I wake up at like four a.m. and then force myself to go back to sleep till six, and then I take my dog for a two-hour walk, and then then my day starts. So, so <laughs> this really is. So, so 9.30 is not too horrific for you then? 9.30 is actually the time that I'm actually in my best zone. And then I start to go downhill around noon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, incredible. Well, like I say, it's, you know, it, it's amazing to have you here. And um, I've I've done a lot of sort of, um, it sounds, sounds a bit creepy really, but I've been looking at a lot of your stuff online. And and your your website is an interesting website. I'll say that in in the nicest possible way. There's not a lot of it, um, but the important stuff is there. And yeah. your your discography and your CV, I, without looking at photos, you I like this guy must be like eighty to have a CV like that. And and you're kind of seven or eight years younger than me, and and, and that blows my mind. How many things you you know? So hats off to you, my friend. That is some CV. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. You I see, mean, I haven't, I haven't updated the website in like three years, so it's missing some stuff. <laughs> so there's a lot more to go on. I I hope so. I mean, I'm enjoying it. I guess you're in the position where you don't really need to update websites and do social media. You're doing what you want to do, and, and I guess you don't need that. Am I right? Well, I do social media, and yeah, so, and I'm, I think that it's good to have the websites and the, the social media, and I enjoy doing that stuff, but I think I'm in a position where I have work, and the most important thing for me is to just keep keep working, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily need to promote myself mm -hmm. to get the work. So it's like, but you know, it's all a continuing process, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's always nice to have... Um, people like myself and, and, you know, fans of what you do, it's always nice to be able to see what you're up to and uh, enjoy it. You know, obviously yeah. I, I, it is a hassle if you're busy having to update social media. I mean, I don't do it from, from gigging point of view, but from this, I know how much work it is for a podcast trying to oh, yeah. it and get the word out and trying to contact people. Um, so, you know, if you're busy recording, producing and writing. I'm sure it's even worse. So, you know, I totally exactly. get it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. If you really want to do it right, you have to hire someone. Yeah. You know, which a lot of people do. Or you just got to be on it a lot. I mean, I, I, I do a fair bit. I, I, my, my dog has an Instagram account. That's like my main <laughs> social media posting. 
<laughs> well, it's all important stuff, and it's a very cute dog as well. So you know, it's, that's yeah. that's cool. So let's go back to the kind of where music entered your life, if, if you like, Homer. I mean, you know, before drums, what's your kind of first memories of music? Because it always interests me. Well, my parents were both. Um, like classically trained pianists and my mom taught piano and my dad was composing. So my house was like filled with like piano music all the time. And so that's like, it's just that really. And then like when my parents were 10, they were like, when I was 10, my parents were like, oh, you should pick up an instrument. Which one do you want to play? It's like just anyone you pick. And I was like conga drums. <laughs> wow. And so, and so that's what I did for like a year. And then, then I can switch to the drum set, and then that began something that was unexpected. Mm. Conga, that's not your general first choice. <laughs> what, I have to ask, what inspired that decision? <laughs> well, I went to this like jazz concert at my sister's high school, and it was like a jazz band, and there was a conga player, and he was playing this, and it sounded like, and I was like, I want to play that instrument. <laughs> that's, that's what I chose. And did you get did you get pretty deep into it in that in that first year? I mean, I did, took a, a lesson every week, and I really liked it. And then the teacher like had to move; he moved to Africa, and mm-hmm. I got really sad. And he was like, "You know, you should just continue te- learning with drumsticks with this other guy." And so he sent me like a drum; he gave me a drum pad and sticks. And then I started with this other guy. And then I was like, "Cool with it." So I didn't get that good at congas. <laughs> I wasn't really like thinking. I was too young to be thinking about any of this stuff. It's like ten, you know. Yeah, it's pretty young, that isn't it? And and is it is it something you still do today? Do you dabble with percussion at all? No, I'm terrible at percussion. I never do it. I always hire it out. Yeah, as a producer. Of course, well, it yeah. It's different. Yeah. Mm, I mean, I do a little bit of if I have to, but I don't like to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I get. There's always somebody who's going to be better at the job than yourself, isn't there? And you, you want the best for sure. Yeah, yeah. And the conga stuff that I learned, like it hasn't carried over. Like it was like one thing, you know. And the people who played congas, like there's a technique that I don't know still. Yeah. You know? Ah, no, it's good stuff. So, as as far as influences go, um, as a youngster, what I mean, what inspired you? What what who was around at the time? Uh, obviously, because you're your musical style goes back way before you were born um way before i was born as well well not way before but you know a certain time before what was kind of what was turning you on at that point musically the first thing was like grunge rock well it was like first was the congas and then i learned the drums and then i did the pad for a year and then he left and then i got sad again and then he he hit me to his other friend, Matt Petuto, who had a drum set. And so then I went to Matt Petuto's house and then he started showing me how to play drum set. And that was the first time I played on a drum set. And basically Matt Petuto taught me Booker T and the MGs as the first thing. He's like, you have to learn this if you want to learn anything. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I learned that. And then my friends were into like Nirvana and I was into that too. So we started a grunge band. And I was like, can you teach me how to play like Dave Grohl? And he was like, sure. But then you also have to learn the whole Booker T repertoire first. And then I, I can teach you Dave Grohl easy. And I was like, okay. So that was like right off the gate. I was coming in it from like the back end or the early end or something. Yeah, sure. And then when, you know, after like doing the grunge thing for a couple of years, I switched schools and I started a jazz band. They had a jazz band. And the guys in the jazz band are guys I still collaborate with today. And they're yeah. just incredible musicians. And at that point, they were like, because I wasn't thinking music at all was my going to be my thing. I was just like kind of doing the drums for fun. But th- these kids were a little more serious when they were younger. And it was like, but you, it wasn't grunge. It was jazz and stuff. And so then I switched to jazz when I was like 13 or 14. Yeah. That um, was like the switch. I think if you're going to do it, that's a really good age to do it as well. Because yeah, you know, it's you're young enough where everything you're going to soak everything up and and, and it's going to become for sure. Yeah, I, I think I've I've always been a total pretender with jazz, and I don't mind saying publicly it's horrible when I do it. It's just not. Uh, well, the thing that happened with me is I learned jazz for like two years, and then I was like, I can't even do this. But then during that jazz thing, I I got into funk and soul. 
Mm. And then I was just like, okay, it's not about jazz for me. Like I love jazz. It's not about grunge. It's just about like funk, soul, R and B. And I basically like got into that when I was 15. And the first thing was funk. It was like parliament Mm. and like George Clinton and like, I don't know. It was just basically parliament. That was like all we knew. Yeah. And then other people who are older than us were like, well, there's more stuff than just parliament. And so then they started making us mixtapes with these, you know, James Brown. And then it was the meters. And then it was like these rare 45s. And then by the time I was 15, like I had a band that was playing like a me, it was a meters cover band. It wasn't a cover band. It was a meters ripoff band called the mighty Imperials. And we got like a 45 out on this weird local label and we went to England when we were like 16 and played the jazz cafe. Wow. So like I got kind of thrown into this world that I wasn't really like necessarily like, you know, thinking that much about it was just all very like fast and young. That's amazing. So you came over to here and the jazz cafe, I mean, which is a great venue. Um, yeah. Yeah. A well-known. We played there like, twice i think I and mean, there's an article written about one of the shows that we were these 16 year olds playing like you know old new orleans cats and stuff and it was like a whole thing and then the band didn't last because we all had to go to college and stuff but <laughs> it was like cool while it lasted i can't i can't imagine as a 16 year old getting offered a gig you know so far away i mean it's not like yeah. it's in another state it's you know it's we're talking yeah. eight or ten hours away on a on a flight how did that? Yeah, no, was, that must be a good memory was, for you. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy, but it was also like a factor of being in New York. You know, it's like I went to a private school in New York, and the guy who owned this record label was a friend of one of the parents whose le- my friend taught saxophone to. It was like that was like we were like we were kind of in a different world to begin with. You know. We had a little advantage there. And so the whole thing felt definitely crazy and surreal, but it was also like there was like luck factors in mm-hmm. there. We weren't like that good or anything. It was just like we were into like this weird type of music and this other rich guy was into it and he kind of was like hurt us because of a random connection. And then all of a sudden we were like being flown to England for, you know, we didn't understand it. It was just like, this is cool. Go with it. Yeah, just go with it. And I mean, let's be honest, that, that style of music for, for young guys, you know, 15, 16, it's quite unusual anyway. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing to to say, oh, yeah, I appreciate it. I like it. But for that to be the sole thing that you're, if you'll pardon the pun, soul and funk, um, that you're into and, and you're playing, I think is really unusual but in, a, in a great way, of course. Yeah. I mean, I kind of look at it as we are kind of like music geeks, like we're but trying to be like cool, you know, like. Instead of like geeking out on something geeky, we were geeking out on like this really cool era of music yeah. that no one knew about or most people didn't know that much about. Sure, sure. Oh, incredible. So <clears throat> so once once the band folded, where, where, what was next in the in the journey, if you like? Well, during that during that process of playing with the Mighty Imperials, um, there's another there's a label called Desco Records, and that's the label that flew us out there and put out the single and the label also had a band called Sharon Jones and the soul providers. And what happened was the two owners of the label got into a falling out. And then like Gabe Roth, who owns Daptone records started Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings and started Daptone records. Yeah. And then Philip, who was the other co-owner was the drummer in Sharon Jones and the soul providers. So Gabe needed a drummer and he had met me and recorded that single, Mm -hmm. the mighty Imperials. And he was like, do you want to be the drummer for this band? And I was like, I'm down. And so that was like the beginning of kind of a career journey right there. Cause that was like a long career with that band, you know, and it's still going. Yeah. The band is no longer active. It's, it's, um, were you, did you feel comfortable slotting straight in to that band? I mean, was no, Sharon, no. was Sharon a hard taskmaster? Oh yeah. No, the whole thing was like, not, I was like, first of all, I was like, I'm not going to be able to do this because I wasn't technically very good. And secondly, like I wanted to go to college and like all that stuff, but the workload at the beginning was totally reasonable. Like on spring break, I came and recorded the record 
and Gabe had to like chop up the drums on the tape because like he was recording to tape and there was no easy digital then. And my plane was so bad that he chopped together like eight takes to like make these things work. Okay. And, and then we would go on these short little tours and it was fine. And then, but like, as a drummer, I was always like, everyone was always stopping their feet and being like, pick it up, slow down. You know, like I was always messing up and just like trying to keep up. But then like when I finished college, like I was trying to just like figure out what to do with my life. And the band was like touring more. And I, I was like, like maybe I'll get a job. And I got a job like packing boxes and something and something like that. And then the band was making like twice as much money on than the box packing. So mm -hmm. I was just like, let me just do the tour full time and see what happens. Yeah. And then like that became a whole other world of difficulty that's where i actually learned how to play the drums yeah it was like that eight years of touring behind sharon yeah. because it's like the rhythm is like there you know yeah incredible and and i bet your parents were were like incredibly happy and supportive to to see yeah. you this. yeah they were super supportive obviously they're like pick an instrument drums cool whatever and and, and there you are doing it and getting paid and yeah touring and record i mean that's the ultimate isn't it you know you must yeah they must have had such a such a pride in 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 you've gone and done it and uh yeah but honestly i was like not happy doing that for a long time because i learned later that like i'm a homebody right. and like the touring thing like it was just not for me so like it was many years of like finding subs and trying to figure out the balance between all the personalities and how to like come in and out in a graceful way yeah. so it wasn't it wasn't until like 10 years later that I feel like even though my parents were super proud of me that I was like okay now I'm doing what I want to do you know but at least you've done it to know that it's not for you the touring yeah. at least you've done it and you can say I've I've been there I've done that and it's not my thing you, yeah. nobody can say anything because you've paid your dues and 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 that's that simple as simple as that's true yeah. yeah yeah and then I can do the I still like performing, you know, I can do a show here and there. It's just the touring. So yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And, and, and I'm fascinated to, to hear about the, um, the, the recording process of, of Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, because it, they, they don't sound like fairly recent recordings that, you know, a lot of effort yeah. has gone to, to make them sound, uh, authentic from the sixties and the seventies, sixties yeah. more, I'm guessing. Um, so what 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 was it like recording? Was it all done live, or was it um, was it tracked separately at the time? You know, the way that we tried to kind of mimic the records that we were like enjoying. Yeah. Like, I think the philosophy was like it wasn't. Try, I mean, it is mimicry, but instead of calling it mimicry, like we were thinking more like, okay, we're going to just continue whatever they started mm. and skip all the other things that happened. And, and so it's like, if you think about it like that, you just have to approach the technology you have like they would have approached it. So like Gabe maybe had like an eight track recorder at the time. It's like, so we have one track for drums, one track for bass, one track for guitar, one track for horns, a couple of tracks for vocals, something like that, you know? And then it's like, well, if you want to do it like that, you have to all learn the track. You don't necessarily have to all be in the same room and do it together, but at least the drums and bass or something yeah. to lay, lay it down. And then as you get better at that technology, then you can start doing cool things like recording the whole band live and getting it really nice. But really it's more about just capturing the performance with less technology than we have now. It's like instead of using eight mics to capture a drum set, you have to figure it out with one. Yeah. And then in order to do that, you have to figure out how to play like they played back in the day so that one mic is going to sound good. So you li you play, then you listen, then you play again, you change everything Yeah, based on what you're listening to. So you That's like have to the hit the bass drum harder or, 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 or... Exactly. Or, or, yeah. Less yeah. snare drum, always less hi-hat. Yeah. Always less hi-hat. Usually the kick drum always sounds good and the snare is different. Like we want the middle, you want the side, you want the thing, but always less hi-hat. And every once in a while, a little more hi hat. Mm -hmm. That's like almost always the case. Yeah. It's like mixing yourself, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. most drummers yeah. sit down in the studio and they play the, the, everything with perfect loud dynamics, and people are like, 
the hi hat's too loud. You know, <laughs> hi hat's always too loud. But like if you're recording with one mic, you got to be like, and that's the way guys back in the day must have done it. Yeah, you know, and that's where that whole what I figure. Yeah, the whole sound and feel has come from that. You know, so exactly. Why why not use it and respect it and and. But yeah, I think it's yeah. a great thing. It, it, it's um, it's like that Clem Catini thing. It's like Clem. You hear him on all the records. He plays the same thing, but it's nasty and it's always good. And it's just like the hurdy gurdy man shit when he's like playing half time. He's actually playing like funk, and he just keeps playing the fills over and over again. It's just like you can't get better than that. It's yeah. like so. How did how did he do that? He played a fucking dope Ludwig kit that sounded beautiful, and he had beautiful dynamics, you know, yeah. and great feel. That's it. That's the magic there. It's it's not it's not a secret yeah. ingredient, is it? It's not. Yeah. There's no like, oh, I'm not going to show you my secrets. It's like you put a mic up and then you play drums, then you listen to it and make sure it sounds good. Yeah. And- I mean, simply enough. Obviously, there's a lot of other stuff once you get into the rest of the band and the mixing and everything, but that's the basics of it for me. And was this the case all the way through all the recordings? Was it all done in a similar style? Um, or did you, did you change as, as the band got bigger and I suppose budgets got bigger and every record's a little bit different because you walk in with a different set of references in, in your head. Yeah. And then every time you make a record, you get a new sound with the drum set because it's not going to be the same one day from the next. So yeah, everything's a little different, but the mentality is usually the same. But then, of course, like I've done all sorts of weird sessions. I mean, now I do a lot of stuff that, you know, I just send drums over the Internet. Like if people want my drums, like it's not that's not the same process, but I do that, too. It's you know, it's called earning a living at the end of the day as well. So, so yeah. you know, you're just going to you've got to you just got to do these things. I mean, I, yeah. I think my introduction was um, 100 Days, 100 Nights, which I think is just a stunningly gorgeous album. Um, oh, thank you. Which uh, and and the the opening track is just just beautiful. The sounds, everything, the band, the the horn section that that it starts with is just like it's got that that vintage sound. That to- oh, it's just something else. It sends a shiver down my spine when I hear it. Now, obviously, um, you know the recording equipment is 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 very important when you're doing that. But also the gear that you play, it needs mm-hmm. to be authentic. So what? We're going to talk vintage drums now. What what kind of what was your go to? Did you have a go to drum set on on those albums? Or yeah, you- yeah. It was this red like it was this red like fake Ludwig kick drum, and then two Ludwig toms, and then I had my own Ludwig club date. Those were all I used for the first like eight years. Now I have Gretsch, but um, those Ludwigs did me did me well for a while and i don't know the kick drum that was at daptone but i know it was a red sparkle that looked like the other two ludwig times but didn't have a badge right so it might have been something else and i'm guessing everything was wide open on them uh no no tape no pillows no, it's, no, it's, no yeah no no there's there's taping there's wallets it's all it's all depends on like it's all about how much, you know, yeah, of course. it's definitely sometimes mostly open, but on hundred days, you know, like Gabe, Gabe Roth, the engineer and producer, that guy has a, a really great, um, like scientist brain when it comes to sound. And so like the first day of tracking or the first two, three days of tracking, like we'll spend two or three days just getting drum sounds. Mm. And and by the end of it, like the Tom, one of the Tom Toms like hanging from the ceiling because like it wants to resonate more. And the other one is like behind me and the mic is like right here. It's like weird, but it's like all he's like, he knows exactly what needs to happen to get it to sound even better. And like if I just do that thing I was saying before where I listen and play, like it could only get so far, you know, but you have a sound engineer who really knows like how you play and everything. Then it can go to another level. It must be a thrill working with somebody like that who's got it is your your best interests, his band's best interest, and the band's best interests. It's not just get in and do it and and yeah, yeah, yeah it's a totally different process. Yeah, yeah, but and it's also I'm, kind of it also gets intense. You know, it's like it's not just a day's work. It's like this. Everyone is so invested in it. Yeah, you know, all consuming. I I I love hearing these sort of stories. Not enough is said about how this how it was achieved and uh, yeah. yeah. It's it's great. I mean, can can we talk about your 
while we're on the um, uh, equipment uh, subject, you're slightly unorthodox. Um, oh, yeah. Kit set that's, up. A whole, that's a whole story in itself. So when I was like 30, around 30, um, my right foot stopped working, right? And I was like doing all these gigs. And I, I remember this, I had this Nora Jones session <laughs> and it was like my right foot. And I was doing these Mark Ronson sessions and these Nora Jones sessions, Mark Ronson sessions a lot. And I had one Nora Jones session. And I was like, I was starting to like, like just get freaked out because my foot was like not responding to what I was telling it to do. But no one else was noticing because it was like not that far off, you know, okay. just a little bit. And so I went to this Nora Jones session and like my foot just like like crapped out. The song was too difficult. I was like smoking too many cigarettes. And I was just like, they, they were like, we got what we needed. It was like the first time I had been asked to leave a session, you know? And I was like, I was like, I knew I, I had a problem. And so I basically was like, okay, fuck, what do I do? And then like, I had a gig and I started telling people, like my friends, like, I think I need to take a break from drumming because something's wrong with my foot. But I had a gig in Mexico City with the Dap Kings and I just bought a double bass pedal on Craigslist and brought it to the gig and then shut the hi-hat and played the gig with my left foot and no one noticed. And I was like, okay, I got a solution. And so then it took like years of evolution to get to where it is now, but now it's a nice setup. It's like kind of actually like a different flow and like, it's really easy to record and you could put the toms anywhere. And I don't know. It's just like, I have my own way of doing it now, you know? I can't. So does your left foot now feel as comfortable as your right foot ever did when it was 100% as it should be? Yeah. Really? It feels better. Yeah. But my right foot has now been able to start manipulating the hi-hat too, which is great. That I can imagine trying to get open tones on your hi-hat was was horrible. Dude, I had that's a funny story. I actually got called to California for a week to play on a Cheryl Crow record. And I was like, great. This is right when I did this. And I was like, I, I was like, listen, I'm down to do it. This is my fee, but I have one stipulation. He was like, what's that? I was like, I can't open the hi-hat. <laughs> and he was like, and he was like, that's fine, that's fine. I'm like, whatever, I don't care. And then I did the session. <laughs> But I was really nervous about it because I was like, you know, if you get paid to do something, you can't do it, something as simple as like, it's like, it's like, what do you do? You know? Wow. That's the, uh, did, did he, did he ask a question why you couldn't open the high out? Was it just, okay, that's fine. He didn't care. And then, and then on the session, people were like, oh, can you open the high hat here? And I was like, look at the producer. I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> you know, other people like. We we're just like okay, fine. Wow, that's um. So did it take quite a while to be able to get your right foot good enough to to do the? Yeah, well, for the first two years, I just used the double bass pedal, and so there's no option. I closed the hi hat as tightly as I could, and then I just no one even noticed. They're like, "Why do you have a double bass pedal?" And I was like, "Well, because <laughs> it's I have this like this neurological disease or whatever." And then I basically one day I was like, "Okay, it's time." Like this has gone on long enough. The foot feels good. I'm never going back. Let me switch this around. And then that was an evolution. Once I started, once I switched around and my right foot was now on the hi-hat and not just sitting dormant on the bass drum doing nothing. um, At that point, I started to try to open it. And I was like, it's pretty hard. (laughs) It's actually way harder than learning. The bass drum of the left foot is quite easy. Yeah. Opening the hi-hat with the it's still hard for me, but I can do it like to a certain extent. So I'm guessing you're playing open handed then now. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Okay. So your high hat. I play left footed. So your, your high hat then must be, is it kind of to the left of your floor, Tom ish? No, uh, yeah. Yeah. I put the floor Tom usually right, right next to me where it would normally go if you're a righty. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> the uh, Floor tom's right next to it, the right, yeah. And then the other tom could go anywhere. And anyway, I don't really even use four toms. Like the biggest tom I use is fourteen. Right. Okay. Like I don't fuck with sixteen or anything like that. I fuck with twelve and thirteen and the and like even the little ones. Oh dear, I love that. So I got God forbid anybody who has to kit share with you at any point in your like forget so it. So annoying. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear me! And 
obviously, you know, you're you're a hugely successful drummer, but you, you've the production side is plays a part, a huge role in your 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 life career and work. Now, when did that uh, when did that kind of enter your your life, if you like? So, like I said before, when I was like in my twenties, I was touring and I didn't really like. I, I wanted to be home more. I had a dog and, and a partner, and I was like, "How do I be home?" <clears throat> so I finally figured out like the only way is is going to be to make records, and so the only way to make records is to have a studio. So we were, I basically, because we were kind of making records in between tour at my friend's house, and one of them kind of popped off, and it was like this got sampled by Jay Z. And we made some money and we were like, yo, you want to invest in a little studio build out? So we did that. And I was still touring a lot, but I knew that if I was around this guy who was producing records in his bedroom, his name is Thomas Brennick, that I would learn too. You know, I kind of instinctively knew if I did that. I already had home studio sets because I knew the basics my dad had. He was a hobbyist. Well, he was actually recording set up when I was like a kid in the house and he would do like composition work. And so he had old four tracks and cool synths and stuff. So I was kind of exposed to it. I knew if I had a studio, I could do more stuff and we had some money. So we built the studio and I was kind of hanging out with Tommy who produced these Charles Bradley records. And I was like an integral part in making those with him. And we started our own like label and I did all the uh, artwork and stuff. And it's kind of like, we kind of conceived a lot of the stuff together and Tommy had this you know, beautiful relationship with Charles and they made this amazing music and I drummed on most of it. Yeah. And that was, that studio was called Dunham Studios and we did a lot of stuff there. And when I was there, I took on my first production project. It was an artist named Diane Birch. She's like a singer songwriter and she was kind of had like some heat behind her and I was like really green and I was like, I'm down for whatever. And so I got kind of thrown into like a a production thing that had a budget and a whole thing. And, you know, the record didn't, didn't do that well, but it was my first taste of like production and I really enjoyed it and making the the record, even though it didn't do great. Like I love that record. And like, I still like, I'm proud of the songs that me and Diane made together, you know, and I got a taste of that. And I was like, I want to do more of this. So do you find that most of the stuff you produce, you generally play on as well? Is that is that generally how it works? You're kind of there to do both, or is that not always the case? It's not always the case, but it kind of ends up being the case most of the time. Yeah, I would prefer to not play on all the stuff um, because I prefer to just be behind the board. But a lot of times it's like people are coming to me for the production and the drums. Mm. So at least like, you know, they're like, why are you not playing drums on this? I'm like, okay, like I'll put drums on it, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I guess from their point of view, it makes sense because it's one less person they need to employ. And exactly, yeah. they don't have to get the right guy because he's there already, you know? I, yeah. I, I get that. I get that. But I equally, I see why you'd want to just do your... Well, it depends on the genre. Like a lot of times I've been making this like 80s genre music and like that's a little bit too advanced for my style. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's like my style like stops at like 77 or something. And so it's just like literally it's like anything after that is just not really my bag. But people want like, oh, we want some 90s stuff, R&B. And I'm like, I mean, let's try. <laughs> Probably want to hire someone else. That, I mean, that's, that's, you know, you're a very humble guy. And I'm sure, you know, you, you can give a little more than you perhaps say you can. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> I trust me. Like, I can't play reggae. I can't play Afrobeat. I can, yeah. can't play jazz. Like, there's a lot of things. Like, can't really play disco. Like, there's a lot of things I really can't play. Yeah. And but, you'll see on all my records that none of them are that. Of course. Well, you know, I mean, I was going to talk about, um, obviously, you've, 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 you've had a, a great, well, you have a, a great relationship with Bruno Mars. And, and that track, I'll be honest, when I heard uh, the track Perm, I didn't yeah. realize, I genuinely didn't think those drums were real. And I mean that in a compliment. I just thought, this, oh, wow. is, this is somebody yeah. sampled something here. And I didn't realize that was yeah. you. So um, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. So you've kind of got this, you. this calling card now. If you want like some proper funk, you're the guy to do it. And, and, and you know, yeah. Yeah, what, what a great calling card to have. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, some proper early style funk. Mm. You know, yeah. yeah, classic. Yeah, I mean, do you? 100%. Obviously, 
when you got called for that, was there any kind of reservations or was it like, because obviously Bruno Mars is, you know, is very current still, huge artist. Yeah. Were you thinking, oh, my plane's not right for this? Or had you heard the track? Well, it, it's a different, it was a very, it, we have a very different relationship because it it's a relationship building process. And so I had actually gone out to LA for a month to hang out with him and work with him. And that particular track was something that I had just, he was trying to get a sound. And I was like, well, this is how you got to do it. And we were messing around and I just played a bunch of drums. And then a year later, he hit me up. He's like, yo, I loop like eight bars of your drums. It's going to be this song. Mm. And then so we worked it out like a deal on it or whatever. But like that was how that happened. It wasn't like, here's we need drums. It was like the it was kind of like a sample, but it was a sample of a session that we did together. Good enough you know? Me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's you play in it. It's the end, of the end of the day, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Actually, I only play on the main part. He had to make a bridge and someone else played the bridge <laughs> right i think it's ben brody or something oh hey but but you know so what so are you happier are you would you say there's an equal kind of joy from playing and producing or is it does one lean more to, to joy uh, def definitely my favorite is writing really 100 percent writing yeah that's what i love okay yeah playing uh, is okay and producing is stressful you know <laughs> Producing is stressful. Playing's okay. I kind of love playing when it's really fun, but writing to me is the most satisfying. So I'm guessing but I consider you, writing to be something a little different than maybe other people. I think. Yeah. Do you, uh, you obviously play uh, other instruments then to be able to mm -hmm. facilitate that? Yeah. No, but at the same time, I'm very I'm an advocate for drum part drum parts being an element of the songwriting because. Uh, the, some of the most valuable parts of songs these days are the samples of the drums. Mm. And I just, all of my idols, like, like basically like all of my idols, like missed out on tons of money because they wrote these beautiful drum parts and they don't have credit for it. Mm. And so it's like, even if you're playing boom, tss, whack, tss, boom, tss, whack, I'm like, I wrote that part. If you want to use it, you have to give me writing or you can play it yourself. You know, yeah. Yeah. it's like, Unless you tell me exactly what to play, like you want exactly what to play, then I'm considering myself a writer as a drummer. Oh, so it's all intertwined. Yeah. You know, and that's how I work. Like that's how I make my money. And that's how the people I work with, like kind of like, that's how we work together, like yeah. smoothly, you know, and, and every, and, and people are more hip to that because in the modern industry, like the people who ha get a lot of the writing are the programmers of the beat. And so it's like, it's basically the same thing. You know, it's like you're either playing the drums with your fingers or you're playing the drums with sticks. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you're still programming a beat. Cool. And so you should be getting the same credit as the guy who programs the beat. And, and, and are people yeah. generally cool with that? And they'll say, is a percentage yet? And, and it's always worked out. Are they generally mm -hmm. happy with no, it? No, it's not, it's not always worked out, but it works out, I think, the way that it needs to work out. Like I, I'm very upfront about it. Like, I'll be like, if you want to do this with me, like, this is how it works. And, you know, I, it took me a while to just kind of develop the way to talk about it. Sure. But yeah, people are down and then I do. It, and the people who aren't down, like that's fine with me too. I really understand that people are very precious about their writing because I'm precious about my writing because I do also write lyrics and songs and all the things. And so I understand if someone's like, oh, I can't do it like that. Then I offer them a fee, but it's usually quite high <laughs> to make you know, it compared. Yeah. yeah. But I guess if, if it's done in advance, then there's no hard feeling. There's no, there's no time wasted. Yeah. This is how it's, I work. Take yeah. it or leave it. Well, it's like it's years of learning of feeling a little bit let down because like, for instance, like one of my favorite records I ever worked on was uh, Bruno Mars Locked Out of Heaven. And I wrote that drum part. Right. And I argued for my publishing on it, but it was too late and I was too young to understand. And I didn't, you know, and I get it why I didn't get publishing. I mean, there's a lot of people involved in all of these songs, right? Mm. But by the same token, it's like, that's how you learn. Like, and even before that, the Amy Winehouse record, like I wrote a lot of those drum parts mm. and I think they were very transformational on those records. Yeah. But I was too young to be like, hey, give me writing. And when I did say that after the fact, they're like, are you kidding me? You're just a session drummer. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like if I'm a session drummer and getting paid, 
then that's all I do. But if I'm a writer, then it's different. So I have to approach it like going into it. Like, yeah. Are you hiring a writer or a drummer or both, you know? Sure. Well, you know, it, it, it harks back to, uh, we were talking about Clem Cattini early, earlier. Yeah. And he, he was ju- just took fees on everything. And you, you look at the songs he's been on and, you know, yeah. he, he, he's, I'm sure I don't mean to offend anybody, but I'm sure he's not a wealthy man. Um, yeah. a very humble life, you know, and is a very, very nice guy. But it could have been very different with, you know, things were done yes. in a different way. Um, yes, and, exactly. and that's a great example. That's a great example of like, you know, I'm sure like Hurdy Gurdy Man drums have been sampled and like, you know, it's like, you know how much that would have paid him? Or it's like, yeah, I actually wrote a list of my idols for this because I was excited about talking about all this stuff. And like on there is like, Clyde Stubblefield, who like, and and Jabbo Stars, and those two guys have played on more records than probably any drummer in the history, because of how many times that one track, Funky Drummer, has been sampled. Yeah, and he doesn't own any of it, and it's like that to me is like you know it's kind of criminal. Yeah, and I'm I'm like I'm an advocate for drummers like standing up for this. It's hard though because no one wants to give drummers any credit on the on the writing side. They're like you're just the drummer. It's like well yeah, but Look what happens with these drums. <laughs> yeah. They make whole records with your drums. Yeah. Try doing it without it. You know, and, exactly. and you made a point there. It's it's beyond sad. It's criminal, isn't it? As you said, almost. Yeah. That, that that's happened. Um, but good on you for, for, for changing, you know, changing the way things work. And even if it's only for yourself, you've got to, yeah. you've got to stand up and be counted, haven't you? You know, it's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And, and you keep working and you keep doing your thing. So, hey one of those things if people, you know people like not paying you like you know it's easy when a lot of people don't have money i'm like hey i'll do it for free just give me some of the publishing if it works out if you use my part yeah. and so in a way it makes these negotiations easier instead of like how much do you want it's like i don't want anything yeah you know except <laughs> the thing yeah you're kind of sharing the risk almost aren't you yeah exactly if, if, if it doesn't exactly. sell you don't make anything if it does sell. You're all happy, hopefully. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we talked Charles Bradley before, um, and what an incredible artist he was. Uh, I think there. I, I vaguely remember watching a documentary on him. Um, I don't know where it would have been uh, some years ago. An incredible story. I mean, you you must have enjoyed doing that that work. That's right up. That's right in your wheelhouse, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, the Charles, I mean, I miss Charles deeply. Like he was just such an amazing guy. <laughs> so I get choked up, but yeah, it's just beautiful guy. And this, and the sessions were always really good. Like, you know, they were like any other sessions we, we worked on, we wrote songs, then Charles would come in and sing them and then we'd redo them. And sometimes we'd come up with it all together and sometimes someone else came up with something and we'd have to replay it because it was so dope. You know, it's just like all those like fun processes of learning how to make records. Yeah. And like, I never, I didn't hang around for a lot of the vocal sessions because there was a real Charles Tommy thing, but the ones that I did hang around for were always like pretty special. Yeah. That's, it, I mean, what, a, what a remarkable talent. And again, yeah. a, a, from what I've seen, a remarkably humble man he was too. Um, just, yeah, beautiful thing, and uh, it, it 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 must give you real pride to know you were part of that. Great guy, just nice amazing. To, nice to mention yeah. him, and you know, totally. This yeah. is one of my favorites. Thing. You know, I still love listening to those records too, which is rare. Mm. With stuff that I've worked on, like I don't always like to listen to it after it's out there. You know, yeah, of course, of course. Nah. It depends on what it is, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, before we go. Um, I think my first introduction to you would have been um, Amy Winehouse. And there's a, there's a strange story here. Um, I interviewed a drummer called Mark Pusey, who is mm. Ed Sheeran's touring drummer, okay. but also has recently recorded the soundtrack from the Amy Winehouse uh, biopic, uh, which is coming out. Oh, okay. And he was talking about the, the drummer, and he'd had all the charts and stuff, and he went... But the, the charts we've got that doesn't match what did it, and he had to go into it and write it all out. And he said, there's a lot going on. So, And that was only 
three weeks ago. And and so here we are now. I'm talking to the guy who did it. So how cool is that? Yeah, yeah, I love that story. And like, I would like to actually see that chart just because I like charts, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> like, this chart, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll happily put you in touch with Mark, and uh, you can have a good conversation about it. But um, obviously, take us back to that. I mean, how how old were you at that point? Uh, um, Two thousand six to twenty four, I think. 24. You know, r- really, that that's really young, isn't it? You know, to be doing stuff mm-hmm. of that magnitude now. At the time, obviously, we nobody knew how big it was going to be. Yeah. Um, and um, where where did you record it? Adapt on Studios. Oh, really? So they yeah. so so Mark Ronson brought everything to you rather than the other way yeah. around. Yeah. Cool. So you were in your home environment to record that. Exactly. Yeah. It's like Gabe was our. We were already rolling with Adapt Kings. Gabe was running the show, and Mark just had these songs and some money, so we could all get paid for mm-hmm. a day's work. Normally, we weren't getting paid to record the record. We were just touring to get paid, and then we'd make the records, hope to make money on the tour. Mm-hmm. You know. But uh, Mark, you know, offered us some money and some cool stuff. And we didn't think that it was like going to be on pop radio, like no, no expectations of that. But it was a cool session. Like it was one of the first we did with him. And I was like, this shit is dope. Yeah. It's yeah. My, it's my dope. Yeah. Because your kind of your thumbprint, your DNA is is all over that, isn't it? You know, um, mm-hmm. and w- yeah, it is. Were you happy with with what came out and how it sounded? Yes, that's probably my, my most like still today like most proud sound in recording or one of them is yeah. the the uh, you know I'm no good break on mm. top yeah yeah that one's so good and then the rest of the record like the weird fills on rehab and like the way they sound they sound real fucking weird and I don't know all the songs that we played on played on six of them out of like half of the record all the ones that we did like they have a sound and i'm proud of all of those songs yeah absolutely and valerie on ronson's record valerie is another one that i'm really proud of because that's a drum beat that i've never successfully played after or before that really once yeah and a drum and it's fucking knocks like i hear it i hear that song all the time still <laughs> i'm like doo-ch, 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 whatever it is <laughs> how do you how do you feel when you hear it because obviously every and, and i don't know about in the states i don't know how big amy winehouse got in the states but yeah. in the uk it was just uh, yeah. en- enormous huge and every cover band at every wedding every whatever yeah. event plays valerie and and so is yeah. it the same in the it's UK? not even her song it's not even her song no, it's no, exactly yeah, yeah. Very different. Dave, Dave, Dave McCabe. Um, but in in the States, it's not so much the Amy thing. And, and this is just now. I don't know about then, but now it's like, this is not a, I'm not trying to flex, but the type of music I play is just played in every coffee shop mm. in New York. And so it's like, I just hear myself playing drums like at least once a week. <laughs> like it's that much and it's like stupid. So you go in the coffee shop, it's like, oh, that's an Amy song. You go in the coffee shop, that's Jonas Brothers. You know, you go to the coffee shop it's and it's like, it's fun because you're like, oh, that's me. But it's also just like at this point, it's not like, it doesn't feel like, it's just like a little bit of like little pleasure in myself, but not like a big deal or something to be like, Oh, I'm playing on this track, you know? Whereas I think most people like, or people who only have a short music career, like they hear themselves like anywhere. And it's like, wow, this is crazy. You know? And it's like, I had that when I was younger, a lot, like, like I can't believe it. Like when Amy came out, I was like, cannot believe this just on the radio at all, like freaking out. And then, but you know, now I'm like just a little bit weathered and just like, it's on the Spotify playlist again, you know. <laughs> I, I guess it must kind of um, flash up just like a nice memory more than anything else. Of just you get like a picture sometimes, when you hear it. You sometimes know? it's like a bad memory too, you know. Well, I'm sure some sessions some sessions are better than others, you know. And 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 relationships come and go, so they're they're bittersweet, you know. Of course, of course. Like you know, you hear something like that. I don't, I haven't worked with Gabe Roth in like five years or something and it's like here's something i did with him it's like man i miss working with him you know it's like he brings up all these emotions and stuff would you say he's he's pretty unique in the way he works oh yeah he's definitely a, he's a, an iconoclast yeah. type guy yeah. he runs his own show out there of course cool. uh so 
at, at the uh, the Amy Winehouse thing, was, was she there? Was she present for the sessions, or was she, did she just let Mark? She get was off only it? she was only present for Valerie. Yeah, yeah. And d- did she did she sing in front of you, or was it uh, was it already done? Man, it we did done. Valerie live. Really? I think so. Wow. Okay. That's what I remember. Wow, I didn't I didn't know that. That's amazing. <laughs> Maybe wow. I'm wrong. I mean, it was the thing that she was there and we were there and we recorded it the same day. So she was doing Scratch Live probably. Yeah. But, I don't know if that was a take or whatever. Wow, that's incredible. See, all these things, I mean, I um, some people say, I don't know why you do these interviews. What's the point? But you get these little nuggets from people who were in the room playing. Yeah. And that's the only way you should. Oh, I got so many nuggets. You know, all these guys, like that's the Clem Katini shit. He was like, I played on King's Chronicles or something, not Mick Avery. And I'm like, what? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, that's the best shit. That's why I was like so geeked out when I started listening to your podcast. I was just like, these are this is the information that I want all the time. I don't really care about like the documentaries and the stories and the who was the guy. I just want to know like what the fuck happened in the session. Exactly. I you mean, know? Let's, let's be honest. Mick Avery is a, certainly a more than capable drummer. Nick well, Avery is one of my all-time favorite drummers. And then Clem comes in and crushes it. It's like, <laughs> that's the story. Yeah. And you don't always get it. You know, some people are quite yeah. giving with their... Some people are quite guarded because they don't know who they're going to upset. Yeah. Which I get. I totally get. Yeah. But I'm happy to take whatever I can get from whoever, you know? it's, it's, it's Totally. That's the way well, I made, a, I made a list of all, like, the best current list I could think of all my influences. I kind of want to shout them all out. Do it. Do it. Can I do it now or should we yes. do that later? Oh, no, no. Do it. Do it. Okay. Al Jackson Jr. <laughs> yeah. No James, James, James Gadsden, Clyde Stubblefield, Joseph Zigaboo Modalise, James Jabo Starks, Earl Palmer, Clem Catini, Gene Chrisman, Mick Avery, Ringo Starr, Ginger Baker, Greg Errico, Andy Newmark, Levon Helm, Doug Clifford, Kenny Buttry, Ralph Molina. James Black, Hal Blaine, Benny Benjamin, Richard Pistol Allen, Uriel Jones, Bernard Purdy, Dallas Taylor, Risk, Russ Kunkel, Stevie Wonder, Frank Beard, Bobby Elliott, Sly Dunbar, Tony Allen, Leroy Horsemouth Wallace, Carlton Bennett, Morris Jennings, Maurice White, Ram, and Idris Muhammad. <laughs> wow, that's quite a list. I wasn't expecting Bobby yeah. Elliott on there. The Hollies? Yeah. I was just, yeah. Great. Oh man, I'm a huge Hollies fan. That dude fucking crushes it. He was then he still he still rolls with them, right? I, he's I just don't, like I don't know if he still tours with them. Um but he's still like but he's been there though since 63 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, long long time. Um I love the English tradition, man. The like I feel like the English drummers really knew like ginger bit was ginger English? Yes, yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. Like ginger and I didn't put uh, what's his name Charlie Watts because he's not a huge influence on me. But yeah, Charlie and Ringo, Kenny, like Kenny Jones. English. Who's that? Kenny Jones, the faces, small faces, and he. he oh he, yeah, that should be yeah. on the list. You yeah. See, I was going to say there's so many more, but this is what I could think of like today. Mm. You know, and it's like, and I keep adding more. Like right before you like called, I was like just adding more to the list, but it just goes on forever. But it's all before 1975. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like after that, like I, I like all the drummers and I respect them, but I could just like they're not on my list of who people influence me anymore. You know, just incredible. Oh, that's some list. I mean, there's a few on there who you you kind of go, yeah, of course, no brainer, no brainer. Al Jackson, yeah, no brainer, no brainer. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, but you know, uh, Gadsden, I knew would be in there, and um, that's obvious. Yeah, hey. yeah, there's five that are obvious. It's like you know. Uh, there's actually 10 or 15 there, obviously. But when you start talking about like Kenny Buttry, that might be obvious to like drummers, but like to most people, it's like, who's that? Yeah. yeah. But I'm like, that dude is like everything. Like he played on so many dope records. Yeah. Right. And like, even like Ralph Molina and like, and then like all the Motown guys, like, I don't even know which one played on which, but I just know those three guys, like like Richard Richard Pistol Allen. I know he played on like half of the Motown joints, and like <laughs> Dallas Taylor, Frank Beard. Frank Beard is probably the weirdest one, but like I yeah. just love these top. Yeah, just love well, them. No problem with that at all. Uh, yeah, great, great drummer, great band. 
Um, yeah, it's it's a hell of a list, and yeah, I, I'm 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 quite impressed by that. I'll be honest. I wasn't expecting quite the variety that's on there for some reason. I don't know really? why. Yeah, but in, in that's that's good. I, I'm, I'm I'm yeah I'm quite. Happy. I mean, honestly, like when people ask me my favorite drummer, I always say like Ringo Starr. Mm. And people are like, really? And I'm like, yeah, he's great. I mean, he's fucking Beatles. Like, yeah. he wrote, like, I mean, he didn't write the songs, but, like, he basically wrote the best drum parts, like, forever. Sure. And people are like, he wasn't that good of a drummer. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. that's, like, literally the best drummer to me. Like, and so I started to change my answer to that because people, like, everyone didn't, like, people re- reacted so negatively to that so now people ask me my favorite drummer i'm just yeah i like them i have like a long list i like gadsden zig probably my all-time top is al jackson jr because it's just the best you don't have you to know, explain just, why yeah oh howard grimes i forgot howard grimes he needs to be on my list now that's a name i'm not familiar with he was al jackson's like other session guy so they had two places running it was like stacks and high and at high for like the Al Green shit, like Al Jackson would come in, but when he was working with Otis, Howard Grimes was the guy doing most of the high record shit, which is like Al Green and Syl Johnson and Ann Peebles. And so it's like either Al Jackson or Howard Grimes on all those records. Howard Grimes is the shit. Obviously, you've got you've you've put up some amazing um influences there. And we, we talked about gear and stuff before. Are you, mm-hmm. do you have like, have you like amassed tons of stuff or are you pretty much, you have, and are you, I have, I have a drum closet. It's got like four drum kits. Yeah. And snare drums, do you, do you just kind of, collect? I have a lot of them, but I basically end up just using Aprilites. So I, I don't really need that many. I have a superphonic and then I have like a couple wooden ones, but basically all the records always end up being Aprilites. Mm. Like I would say 90% of the time. Yeah. So that makes it easy. And then I just have a drum kit for every size, but I really only like to use the small ones mostly. Yeah. Acrolyte is my is my favorite snare drum. It's as simple as that. I have two. The Acrolyte is is the, the main one. And then I have a, a drum called a Beverly Cosmic 21. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Beverly brand. They were like an offshoot of Premier in the 60s and 70s. And uh the, the it's called the 21 because it costs 21 pounds. And it is just it sounds very like an Acrolyte. Uh, very oh, cool. Like I got to get one of those. I, I tried to get a Gretsch version of the Acrolyte and it doesn't really sound cool. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's hard. I don't know. There's something about that aluminum shell and the way that Ludwig figured it out is special. It yeah. just does exactly what you want for that genre. Yeah. It is like James Brown and like all that shit. It's got to be. Yeah. Considering you know. it was a budget, a student model yeah, drum. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and are you, are you kind of into the symbols and stuff? Is the symbols have to be old as well? Yeah. 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 I don't have any new gear. I don't even like new hardware, which is why I've had a really hard time. I don't have any like drum deals or drum presence in the drum community because I just buy all old shit. The only thing I have to buy a lot of is sticks. Yeah. And I always want to get a deal with a stick company, like innovative percussion. Like those guys are awesome. Yeah. Like I would love to have that. But like, yeah, I just only have old shit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you know, there's something about um vintage gear that has it's had a whole life before you've taken yeah. it on. Who knows where it's been, who's played it, what yeah. songs it's been on. I love the fact that there's a story behind it. Yeah, you know, it's like there's that and there's also like but beyond the sound, like, I think you can kind of get any size drum to sound very similar to the next drum, like, if you know how to tune them. Sure. But beyond the sound, like, you know, the old wood sounds nice. It's a little different, of course. But it's the feel and the lightness and the way that it all holds together, which I really love. Like, back in the day, like, they were thought of more as these, like, units. Sure. And they were smaller and they were lighter. And now, like, even when you get, like, the small drum kit that's a four-piece thing, it's still a, a bit more heavy-duty, and it doesn't move around as much. Yeah. And I think the vibration of the old drums actually is, like, part of the thing. It's like, I like when the whole thing is moving a little bit. And so it's like, I don't know, it's like all that stuff that keeps it really stable, like, is a kind of a problem for me, you know? Yeah. And that's why I really love the old hardware and the old 
feet. Like the only thing that I buy that's new is like uh, seats, kick pedals. Yeah. And I buy like 90s snare stands because the right. 90s parallel snare stands have this nice, like they're light and they have this nice like arm thing. Yeah. Because you were <laughs> that's saying still you... Not new. that's still not new. That's 30 years old. <laughs> See, you use the Jojo Mayer perfect balance pedal, which was, right, I found yeah. thin. And I, I totally get why. It's, uh, yeah. So I haven't found anything that's that good. I used to use this pedal that I, that's called like a Ludwig, like, like, fuck it was like some crazy name like auto reversible thing and like it was not quite the speed master it was like some off speed master thing and i can't find another one and it kept breaking and i was just like you know i can't find anything else that feels like this so like the jojo i'm just gonna have to set this one up the way best i can you know sure and, and what about heads do you do you leave heads on till they've got holes in them or are you uh, I mean, I'm just like, I, when I get time, I'll change the heads yeah. if they're getting old. I, but I use like I coated ambassadors almost across yeah. the board. So it's easy. I just buy a bunch of them. I keep toying with like calf skin heads and then it's just too much work to like figure it all out. The, have, the plastic stuff works. I have calf skin on these. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Is it better? Is it really better? It's got a warmth to it that you can't recreate with like the fibers. can't get it. You just can't but they are uh, it's it's a lot of work to keep them in tune and you know it's also, also like think, thinking about like the records that i make and i'm like would they have sounded better with calfskin you know because they all do sound pretty warm already yeah yeah and it's like like am i missing out like that's really what i want to know <laughs> no that there's that they they have it's kind of hard to describe you, you kind of sink into them they just got yeah. richness and warmth, and I don't. It's not for everybody, but I, I don't. When really did they? Know. When did they switch? Like, what would Clem have been playing like on like Donovan records? I think he'd have been on Mylar heads. I think he'd have been on. Uh, uh, they switched to Mylar by then. Yeah, I think like so. Ringo, Ringo is on Mylar heads. Yeah, it's I all Mylar. That's yeah. what it's made of. Yeah, frosted so. Mylar. Yeah. I never knew that. I think so. Huh. Anyway, as far as I'm aware, but I've I've been. There's a guy. Um, called Tristan Head and he he runs a company called Dramatic and he makes these he mm. laps them himself and they are they sound amazing they really do they're, they're the coolest things um and they just sound great and they're not overly expensive compared to other makes so i've got i've got i've got um, what are they called the, the dramatic they call them dramatic all right dramatic, well, check yeah. out. and he so i've got on on this on this kit i've got calf skin on uh on the, the rack and the floor tom and i've got uh, i've got kangaroo hide head on my beverly cosmic 21 which sounds <laughs> stunning it really does um crazy yeah it's always all right i'm gonna check it out dramatics yeah trust tristan's a really cool guy and i'm sure he'd send some over to you you know uh, um i can i can i can uh, give you a contact for him and oh, uh, thank you so there we go look um homer this has been an absolute just a treat for me it really has you know i love the way you play um i love the fact that you don't do anything modern <laughs> you know if it's old it's good well it's not yeah, old, good, i like it. modern music though that don't get that wrong no it's no just, yeah it's just not you that's fine that's and that's that's great that's yeah. what well, i like inserting music. like the old into the modern yeah that's what people come to me for yeah. yeah and and that's your thing and and that's why you do it well and you know that's why you get booked and paid for and and yeah yeah so it's been thank an absolute pleasure that. i really really appreciate it so thank you for giving up your time and um you know i'll uh, hopefully we'll we'll our paths will cross at some point or other you never oh, know i love that <laughs> good man cheers homer thank you so much take care See you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.